pull in a cascading style sheet up there. You see it at the top, at the top there. And you can actually check for the computed style of a particular uh, CSS property. If it's set to something you expect that the user is logged in, you can actually detect if that user that has in hit your site is actually logged in or not. So from the bad guy's perspective, visitor comes to a site and goes, I want to know if they're logged into MySpace, Facebook, Bank of America, or whatever site, and they could easily do it just via this method. They force you to call in a file, some cross domain, and they check a value that's there. In JavaScript, you check for a variable name or a function call. CSS, you check for a particular property because you're not logged in past the login screen on your bank. You probably can't access that CSS or JavaScript file anyway. So it's a very easy, uh, e easy thing to do. And there's many other ways to perform this. Um, right now, I can just tell you uh, right now, the browser vendors aren't fixing these right now. Um, any site that you visit, they can tell what sites you visited and what sites you're logged into, whether you want them to or not. This is all possible right now. Um, to give you uh, another example, an oldie but goodie, just for, since we have a little bit of time. Um, let's say you gave me 100 guesses to guess your web bank. I just pick 100 random domain names to guess your web bank. Now, let's say I took this gigantic list of 100 and I put this in a web page, and I created a, a hyperlink for each one of those links. And what do we know about links? When you visited one, it's blue, it's purple, and when you haven't visited one, it's blue, right? You just use a little bit of JavaScript to tell the computed uh, color of the link, and I can actually tell what sites you've been to just by brute forcing URLs. Is that like kind of like a duh factor, right? Like, Everybody getting that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that's out there today. It's not fixed. It's been around six, seven years. And what we actually found is that, well, the bad guys can actually force a user to make a request they didn't intend to make to any location in the world, no matter what. What we found is that the bad guys aren't actually using this, these particular methods here to get in additional intelligence on the users. It's actually the marketers who are doing this. They actually like telling, uh, figuring out what, uh, what sites that you've been to and logged into because they can serve more targeted ads based upon that knowledge. And it's very hard for anybody to detect because it's technically not considered malware. All right. So what are some of the fences? Uh, uh, one of the things you can do is, as a developer, do not store anything user sensitive, any identifier customizations in a CSS style sheet. Try not to do that. Sometimes it's impossible, but do that if you can. Uh, make sure you know to store the properties in their own CSS file and ensure that URL is an unpredictable location. So if you have some user customizable JavaScript or CSS, put it in one file, tie it to the user, make sure the bad guy can't guess it on behalf of that user, and you should be good to go. JavaScript and CSS, same sort of, same sort of deal. It won't prevent the user from knowing, the bad guy from knowing the user uses your site, but it will prevent them from knowing whether or not they are logged in. All right. Any questions so far? Likely much. Okay. Abusing HTML5 stru structured uh, client side storage. All right. You guys are actually going to know a lot more about this than me. This is the Web 2.0 conference, and you guys do use a lot of that stuff. There's all different sorts of ways that uh, you can store more data in a user's browser other than a cookie. A cookie has some constraints. Uh, along with it, um, so we have like we like other features. You have you have something called user data in IE5. You have local share objects in you know, since Flash 6. You have Google Gears, and uh, even HTML5 gives us something called HTML5 uh, uh, five structured client side storage. You can store massive amounts of data relative to web uh, relative to web terms in a spot. So consider this: we're going to be storing more and more data on a user's machine. Now, if that user gets cross-site scripted, all that data now belongs to the bad guy. They just have to go find where it is and how you stored it. That's what this, uh, particular, these attacks are going to be. So let's say a bad guy doesn't exactly know uh, where this data is. You know, if you want to acquire a storage object and you want to enumerate through all the values, you're not supposed to be able to do this. Um, browser designs are supposed to protect against this. They just really don't. Um, you can actually loop through different session storage objects. You just loop through the window session storage object and you start finding variables and you can start pulling out data that way. You can pull data out of local storage, same way, just loop through it all. You can do the same loops through the database object and 
loop through the object database. It's a little bit uh, different method, but you can still do all these methods to loop through uh, all the objects. Precondition being, you cross-site script the user on that domain, and you start looping through so you can start extracting data. All right. Should they start uh, you know, using other methods, like you know, they have, we have in HTML5, you can start doing SQL commands to pull data out. If you don't know the structure of the SQL table, doesn't matter. You can use these three uh, these three statements to actually start enumerating the database. We borrow this stuff, these similar techniques from SQL injection. We're just now pointing SQL injection style attacks towards the client, and they're working just fine. You can pull the table names, column names, and everything else. You can even pull the version information you want to make your attacks more effective. We can actually leverage this one step further and start overriding different uh, different variables that the code on the site will then use. So let's say we've cross-site scripted the user and we can document write images and different things like that. And we can start overwriting data in, into the database and maybe enumerate it back out if we want. So again, just because the, you as a developer put the data there doesn't mean it's going to be the same when it comes back out because the bad guy could be manipulated in some way and prevent some really unique security problems. So fortunately, all this enumeration stuff gets to be a little heavy for you know, the web hackers type people out there. So uh, people have already made this uh, much easier on us. You can actually pull down this code. It's called HTML5 CS dump. And if you load this on a cross-site scripted client, it'll actually dump all the data that site has stored in the, in the, what, the, the various data storage facilities. You get a nice dump of everything that's in there. And should the bad guy want to, you can just easily transfer all this stuff off domain, pick it up, and start using it as, as they will. While we've made great gains in web security to get more control over the privacy in our browsers, at least through cookies, we can actually see our cookies, put policies around them and things like that. We really haven't done the same for the local shared objects and the different you know, places that we can store data. And you know, you, you ever try to delete your flash cookies? Anybody actually ever tried to do that? Anybody know where to do that? It's like three people, right? You have to go to Adobe's website and it's got this tiny little box there. It's just like a little crappy thing. So there's other places like the local shared objects. I don't know if there's even an interface to actually pull that stuff out there. You have to actually go deep into the file system and pull those things out. So if you're a browser privacy advocate and want to control your privacy, you have to do a lot more than just delete your cookies now. You have to actually go to all these different locations and pull your data out. Or, you know, there's actually a, a big, uh, big movement out there among the security ranks where people are actually surfing the web in a virtualized environment and restarting every so often from a known good state because they're actually assuming at this point that there's no way they can secure their own browser and must restart over from a known good state every now and then. So that's how a lot of people are doing it. All right, let's move into, there's one legitimate browser security exploit out there, meaning you know a command execution, I guess there's two. Um, this one is affecting Opera. We're going to leverage a cross-site scripting flaw in a particular Opera feature to get code execution and abuse the same origin policy. This is very simple the way it works and it's amazing that no one caught it ahead of time. So you would cross site request forgery a user, let's put that in more in English terms, I force a user to make a connection to a URL location that they didn't intend, in this case to Opera History Search. We leverage a pre-existing cross site scripting flaw in the page that comes out that has some code that will overwrite the Opera star context, if you will. All right, and we put in some code in there. Now, the step two is we inject an iframe to Opera config, and because we now have cross-site scripted into that environment, we can actually change some particular variables in their config. And the one we're interested in this case is the mail to parameter. So instead of pointing to mail to, we can point to you know something else, the calculator, if you will. So, so a three-step process using cross-site scripting and exploit in Opera we get a execution, local file, local command execution on the machine. It happens really quickly in a matter of moments, right when you hit a page. Best solution against, against this? Well, either switch Opera or switch from Opera or upgrade to at least greater than 9.62. Seems to be going really, really fast, but we'll slow down for some demos. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. Um, on the last uh, HTML5 attack, do yeah. you assume that there's a, already a same domain? If you're cross-site scripted on that domain, you will be you will be on that domain. So it's related to this particular thing. Um, I want you to you know let's say think of any button on any website that you could ever click, any link, 
any form button, on any page. If I, as an, uh, an attacker, can force you to click on that button, that would actually be a really bad thing for you. Again, there's all different sorts of buttons that you, I might want you to click on. Uh, DSL router buttons, banner advertisements that make me money, I can change your Netflix queue, that would be pretty interesting. Um, so, uh, let, me, let me walk you through the different examples. So there's all different kinds of examples. There's online polls, you know, I mentioned DSL routers, dig buttons and things like that. Now, how I would actually get you to click on a button is a little bit of a trick, and it's actually very, very simple. All right, what you do is you take a page that you control, my MySpace profile, my blog, or whatever, and what I do is I hover on iframe, perhaps I put in some crazy JavaScript code to make it follow just under your mouse, and I make it transparent. So I let this tiny little iframe on my page, and I go click here, right? Click on this button, but when you try to click on that button, you're actually gonna click on a pre-positioned button that I put just under your mouse. You're actually gonna click on any button that I want you to click on, right? So that's pretty interesting. And when we originally, uh, myself and uh, Robert Hansen originally found this one, it was like, eh, no big deal. People have been getting people to click on buttons all the time to approve from Facebook friends and MySpace friends and all sorts of things. So that wasn't particularly interesting to us. So we said we wanted to create something really cool and uh, more advanced. So we said, you know, what if we can get a web page that could see and hear you? I mean, I use a Mac, right? I mean, there's probably other people that use a Mac and have web cameras. If you don't use a Mac, you probably have a microphone in there, right? So what if we could make you mistakenly activate your camera microphone now? That would be a really cool thing. Um, the problem is JavaScript can access this stuff. Um, so what we know from web hacking, if JavaScript can't do it, you ask Daddy Flash, and Flash can. So you got this little nice little webcam here. And when you write some, uh, a little bit of webcam code, you get this uh, really annoying security dialogue that comes up that says, oh, if you want, if, if, that prompts the user goes, do you want to allow this rogue JavaScript code to turn on your camera and microphone? And if it's at all savvy, you usually go, no, I don't really want that. But the great part about it is, is that uh, prior to Flash 10, and I'm talking Flash 9 here, is that you can make the security dialogue transparent. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, so we developed some, uh, some nice code and started presenting to conferences, and we gave Adobe a heads up, because we thought that clickjacking, the act of forcing a user to click on stuff in that way, was actually more of a browser problem, just a flaw in the design of the way browsers work, rather than Adobe. So when we notified Adobe, they got really pissed off. Uh, they thought we were zero-daying them, because uh, as they explained to us later, that, that apparently they had security controls preventing the, these uh, little security dialogues from being obscured, but they, for whatever reason, weren't working, so we never really noticed. So we had to you know, pull back all our research. Um, but fortunately now, you can actually upgrade to Flash 10 and protect yourself should you choose to. Any, when's the last time anybody upgraded Flash? I got four, okay, cool. The rest of you are not gonna like this next note. All right, so. I am going to show you this page here. All right. This is just a simple piece of flash code that asks for your, uh, asks your, to access your camera. I have a camera pointed at me here, and I have a little bit of code here. I can show you what that looks like. And that's all it really is right there. Okay. And what we want to do is, if I show this to, if I wanted to, you know, hack a user and show this to the user, they're not going to want to click on that for me. So I have to obscure it in some way. So the first step to obscuring this thing is let's put it up in the top right corner, shall we? Okay, shove it up all the way over there so they can't see it. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull that away here. Let me find the other piece of code. We're going to iframe that code in that other page and screen's a little tiny. That's better. Okay, we're gonna iframe that code in, and we're gonna change the opacity of that iframe, okay? We're gonna put it down to this point four. Um, we make it too invisible, you can't see the demo, and that's, you know, kind of annoying. And let's see, is everything looking good? Here we save it, let's hit reload. No problem. See the little allow button there? 
that gives you access. So if we really wanted to, we could make that invisible, right? Just, you know, set the opacity down to 0.01 or whatever it is. If somebody clicks on the link, the green light on my camera turns on. You see that little thing underneath there? That's me taking a picture here. Now, this is actually without the user really knowing, so that's really all there is. It's taking pictures of me right now, and it's uploading it back to the server automatically. You click, you capture a picture, and it's gone. We also retrofitted the code, so if you move, let's say put my hand over it, it takes another shot and uploads it. Right. So now all of a sudden, you click on the wrong thing you didn't see, and a web page can see and hear you. It gets a little creepy, right? And so that's that's click jacking, okay? So you can get a user to click on you know many different things. And actually, I'm being a little weird out here. I want to turn that thing off and just reload the page. Um, so to give you an idea, of the let's uh, go back to the other piece of code real quick. I'll show you how the the, the deming works. So, there we go. So, you hit, the, hit that one, and that's what happens, what's happening behind the scenes. You just can't see it. And we're only displaying the video here because we allow it. Um, you don't have to if you don't want to. So, that's click jacking, so web pages can't see and hear you, so I highly recommend upgrading to Flash 10. So when we found this stuff and we published it, um, somebody actually found it in a 2002 reference in the Mozilla in the Bugzilla database, and they just didn't think it was important enough at the time to fix. It's actually still there, and the browser vendors don't really know exactly what to do to prevent clickjacking. So uh, Mozilla took not Mozilla, I'm sorry, Adobe took ownership over their portion, the Flash stuff, and now right now, if you upgrade to Flash 10, if you try to obscure. The bad guy tries to obscure this little security dialogue in any way. You can just hit the allow button over and over again and it won't do anything. So they've taken active measures against it. Hard to say if it's perfect. Um, so to answer your question, no, I didn't find it in the wild. But we weren't looking either. You know, no one was really looking. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so how do we fix this stuff? Uh, so one, my favorite, is the patch. Little sticky note over the camera. That's my personal favorite. Um, you can actually do frame busting code to prevent any pages that you deem important uh, to not to be framed in by anybody else. If you notice, uh, clickjacking uh, has been hitting Twitter at least twice. Um, so what you want to do is you want to, if you notice you're being framed, is to bust itself out of its skin. And if for whatever reason somebody gets in the way of that code execution to actually bust itself out of its skin, out of the frame, you want to remove the body content of the page because a lot of times the parent can actually affect the, ex the JavaScript execution of the child. So you want to, you know, again, there's a very special frame busting code. This is not the same busting, same frame busting code you're going to find, let's say, in Wikipedia. This is purpose built to prevent this particular hack. So upgrade a flash can, and if you are a Firefox user, you can upgrade with, uh, you can add this nice, very nice NoScript extension, a uh, Firefox extension called NoScript, and it has something called ClearClick to prevent uh, clickjacking by art. All right. Or not. Yes, sir. Uh, what about the X-Frame Options headers on IE8? The which ones? Uh, oh, oh. That's right, I should, should mention that. So IE8 has some new anti-clickjacking features that you can put at the web server layer. So if you respond to an IE browser with a particular, uh, a particular response header, you can say to the browser, do not allow this page to be framed, framed in. The idea is that this one is one way to help, it's an opt-in way to help prevent uh, clickjacking. The problem, it, it will help Website owners who use it, it will help the IE8 users. Anybody that's not using IE8 won't have the benefits, so you're probably gonna have to do both anyway. But very good point, I should've mentioned that. Any other questions? Before we hit number three. All right. All right, we, we have Safari carpet bomb. So there's a number of users that use Safari, both on Windows and on Mac. 
And you can actually, uh, if you're a bad guy, bad guy visits, I mean, uh, let's say if you're an average user, visit a bad guy's website, you come in contact with the website and they force you to access a malicious file. You may or may not want this file, but uh, they can force you to at least touch that URL. The interesting th uh, part about it is that when you, when the, w the way in which a bad guy forces you to access that file, it will actually save that file to a predictable uh, location. Right? It could be any arbitrary file uh, out there. I'll show you how this works. When so the Safari browser is, uh, is served a file with a content type that can't be rendered, some really some very different uh, content type, it'll automatically download it to a default location in a Windows directory. It'll, it'll uh, the desktop in the Windows world and the downloads directory on on in uh, OS 10, um, and it will not notify the user. And you want to see the sophistication of the hack here? That's basically it. You just load a bunch of iframes, all pointing to the same file, and it'll just automatically do this stuff and start littering the desktop uh, if you're on Windows and or your downloads directory on Windows on uh, on OS 10. And this is what it happens to look like on Windows when you're not properly protected. Now we can take our best guess on. What user won't click on this particular type of problem? What is this thing you click and then there's, you compromise and that's kind of what the world we live in today. So, very simple exploit, still out there. A lot of times because most people don't patch. Um, on Windows, you can download the latest version of Safari. Um, that will help you out uh, tremendously. But um, for whatever reason, uh, the, uh, the OS X version of Safari remains unpatched by Apple. Let's move on to number two. We get to pick on Google just a little bit. So Google Gears, uh, great offline framework. Uh, very powerful, you, now you guys know this stuff. You get great offline applications. You get to do more functionality, more power, control the platform. You're on the OS, more persistent apps. All the cool, rich internet application buzzwords we want to choose. Um, there must be, when you're running potentially malicious code that anybody could write, in a desktop environment, you have to take very particular security precautions to make sure it only does what it's supposed to do. Especially if you're going to be loading some JavaScript file, you don't want it to make off-domain requests, you know, to compromise the same origin policy. Um, there was a way prior to the patch, and who knows how many people have actually patched, that you can actually make cross-domain requests and get outside code to, ex to execute in a context of what you should. I'll show you how this works. So, in this case here, um, what the attacker would do is they would create a, uh, a text file that contains uh, some Google Gears commands, uh, maybe accessing a, a database using an HTTP re uh, request object or some kind of module like that. The next thing they do, the precondition here, is that they have to be able to upload this file to, a, to the target website. Let's say socialnetwork.com. They have to be able to upload this, uh, this, this file somewhere. This could be in a JPEG, anything that's file, any, any file the, uh, the site will accept, they upload this file, they, they name the, their, their JavaScript file dot .jp, something JPG. Now what happens is that Google's, uh, the Google Gears worker code, does not cont uh, worker code does not contain suspicious characters. So you upload this code, and you get it on the site, and then you access it, uh, you know, visit this little Google Gears code because that's what you're writing. And you download this code and it loads and executes in the environment. I'll show you how this works to run through the example. Um, so, kind of dual purpose here. But you request to open this, the target sensitive page. That's the target site. And then you point it to your worker object, the permissions file, because that's the one that you uploaded. The Let's say in this case, the the innocent.jpg, and Google didn't take into account there's security precautions around this one, so the code embedded in the innocent JPG will run in the context of the target site. And since it's in that context, it can do whatever the Google Gears code can do, and cross-domain requests, local requests, and all sorts of stuff. And all the things we talk about cross-site scripting then become possible. I know I kind of blazed through this one, but uh, how much time do we have to have here? 132, what time? Yeah. To now? Okay, let's move to number one, shall we? All right. 
Hammer full. Sorry, how do we do that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, get far. Uh, get far is half a gift, half a jar. And the way this works, that's where a gift, when you read a gift, you start at the top because that's where the headers are, the GIF 89A. And a Java archive is a, let's say an applet that's been archived up in a zip file, and when a Java archive is read, just like a zip, it starts from bottom up. Now, imagine uh, for those that are familiar with, uh, let's say, Java or applets, if I can get you an applet to be stored on your domain, I get permissions on that domain when I call it in, the same same origin policy stuff. The great part about it is that you can actually smash this down into a singular file, and I'll show you how this works on the command line. Uh, let's see here. Let's see. All right. Oh, man. All right. So I have a few files in here. I got a Java file, just a quick applet, and I'm going to do, let's say, uh, Java on hello world.java. I compile it, no problem. The next step I'm going to do is do a jar. I'm going to archive this up. SCF, hello world.jar. Is that right? Yep. Uh, hello world.class. Now I'm going to archive it up. So now I have a a jar, a hello world dot jar in there. So it's just a zip archive. So to give you an idea, file hello world dot jar. It'll say a zip file. And if I do the same thing on my little WH logo in there, it'll show a GIF, no problem. So now we're gonna do a cat. We're gonna cut pen two files together. WH logo with hello world jar. And we're going to redirect it to something called gifar. Dot gif. No problem. Now we got that file there. Now the cool thing about it is that this is half gif, half jar. Now here's the cool thing. So I'm going to show you this little bit of code here that I'm going to load. This will be the last demo of the day. Let's see here. I haven't been able to show it to you, but we'll view source it. Let's see here. I'll put it at the end here. So what I did was, this is my HTML. I'm going to call the same file twice in two different locations. I'm going to put make, I'm going to have an image, loaded the image, and I'm going to make it a class loading the gifar.jar as the archive, and it loaded the applet. Same file, two different things. So what happens is when I have this gifar now, when I upload it to a server that accepts images, the server-side security goes, oh, is this an image? Yeah, it's an image. And now I put that on a server that, on a protected domain. I've now put an applet on your domain, and I get all the permissions that come with it. Pretty neat, huh? Works great. All right. Let's uh, bring this to a close. So one, do not accept file uploads, <laughs> if at all possible. Um, if you have to host, um, uncontrolled content, do so on an, IP, on an IP address that uh, is not on a protected domain, that's probably better. Facebook does it really good at protecting against Gifar. Every image that you get, convert to another image no matter what. That does a very nice job. Um, in a web browser, disable third-party browser extensions, uh, and install the latest JVM. Does help some all. Oh. So, we went through a lot of stuff. Hopefully you got a lot out of it. Any questions before we call it a day? Yes, sir. So does uh, JPEG Trend and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, one more. Do libraries like JPEG Trend and PNG Crush automatically? Couldn't, couldn't, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just a little insecure to go. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you have your slides posted somewhere? Uh, I believe the conference has it. If not, you can take one of my cards and I'd be happy to send it to you. Any other questions? My pleasure being here. Hope you got a, got a lot out of it. Thank